following is intended only for mature audiences. Before we get into today's message, I want to warn you in advance that some of the content in this series may be offensive at times, but that's okay, because growth at times requires growth pains. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It's time to mature. So get ready for mature audiences only.
good morning, Connect Church, and thank you for joining me today online for this online-only worship service. We certainly uh, thank you for tuning in and allowing us to come into your homes wherever you are watching and worshiping with us at this morning. And hey, we look forward to being back together next Sunday morning in the Worship Center. But today we're going to continue our message series entitled Mature audiences only. Last week, we kicked off this brand new 2022 message series talking about maturity. And I don't know if there is a more important topic that we can be discussing than the topic of maturing in our faith, in growing in grace. For there are dangers to immaturity. Immaturity and prolonged immaturity especially is the enemy of God-given destiny. That means if we fail to grow up in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we fail to walk in everything that Christ has already provided for us through the cross and through the resurrection. And we want to walk in everything that Jesus says that we can walk in. Last week, we looked at how we needed to mature in our message. And that message is the message of the gospel. Specifically, we looked at the message, the message of faith righteousness, knowing that we are right with God, not on the basis of our works, not on the basis of our performance, but on the basis of what Jesus did for us in his finished work on the cross. Well, this week we're going to look at how we can mature in our mind. And we're going to be talking today a little bit about our thought life. Now, if you joined us last year for our midweek, we spent several weeks talking about our thought life in our Renew You message series. We're going to be kind of going back and looking at some of those foundational principles about how we can mature and renew our mind. For the mind is so very important. It's important because your life will move in the direction of your mind. So the question is that we want to pose today, do you ever think about what you think about. Do you ever stop to consider the thoughts that come in your mind? Do you ever stop to consider the thoughts that, that come in your mind that you keep them there and meditate on those thoughts? Are they good thoughts? Are they healthy thoughts? Or are they negative thoughts? Or are they destructive thoughts? Are they thoughts of truth? Or are they thoughts of lies? It's very important what we think. So therefore, it is very important how we grow up in our thought life. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Paul knew that the secret to a powerful church is a mature church. An immature church will fail to walk in the fullness of Christ. Paul also said to the church in Ephesians chapter 4 that the church should come to the unity of the faith, into the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So it's time for the church to grow up. It's time for the church to, to take its place as the children of God, the sons of God in the world today. And it's time to move to a place from immaturity in the church to maturity in the church. Because if we're not careful, we can create an environment in our churches where we have excitement but no depth. Where we have entertainment but no impact on the world around us. Where we have anointing, but not grounded in character. Where we have gifts, but we have no standards. Where we have power, but we have no principles. Where we have flash, but we have no faith. Where we have glitz, but we have no gospel. And we become a glorified self-help center, just puffing ourselves up where our churches seem to resemble more like daycare centers than they do places where people can come and be empowered with the grace of God and with life-changing encounters through the Spirit. The world needs a church that has grown up. So we do not want that to happen to us. 
We want to go on to maturity so that we can experience real life in Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, we must mature in our mind. We must think about what we think about. We must be intentional with the minds that God gave us because the mind truly is the battleground. The mind is the battleground. It, it, it's, where, it's where spiritual formation happens. It's where discipleship takes place. It's, it's where, where our roots are fundamentally rooted in, in the battleground of our mind so that it can take root and grow into maturity. That it can grow and produce fruit. That it can grow and lead us in the paths of righteousness that Jesus has already made for us. If you're like me, your biggest struggle really isn't with the devil. If you're like me, your biggest struggle is really with the person you see in the mirror. Your biggest struggle really is with this thing right here in between our ears, and that is our mind. For as we mentioned in our Renew You series, you talk to you more than anybody else talks to you. So what are you saying? And I believe, I believe to begin to understand this idea of maturing in our mind, we must understand our three-part being, as has been called in, in Christian circles before. And the three parts that we want to talk about today is body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Of course, we're very familiar with, with our bodies. Our bodies is this outward flesh that, that we have here. It's this earth suit that we are, are wearing. But the soul and the spirit, let's talk about those for a moment. The soul and the spirit are immaterial parts of our being that on one level can speak of our innermost being, our innermost being, our innermost person. Who we are, not, not by the flesh, but who we are on the inside. And sometimes, and in different settings, these words, soul and spirit, can be used interchangeably. But what we find is on, on close investigation, and in some of the scriptures that we find in the New Testament, we see what role the spirit and the soul play in our lives. Listen to what 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says. It says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, or sanctify you wholly as a whole being. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, it names those three things. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit. The word of God penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So we know what our body is. Let's talk about what our spirit is. We have a spirit. And the Spirit is the part of us that really connects us with God. It's the part of us that is, is born again. It's the part of us that is recreated and, and unites with God's Spirit to form a new creation. Before Christ, we have an unregenerate spirit, a dead spirit. But then when we're born again and the Holy Spirit comes in our lives, our spirits are made alive unto God. Then it says in Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, whoever is united with the Lord is one spirit. So the spirit part of you is the part that connects you with God. It's the part that is, is recreated. It's the part that is born again and is united with the Holy Spirit. So that's our body and that's our spirit. But what about this thing we call soul? What about this thing we call soul and how is it used? Well, the Greek word for soul is the word suke, or we might understand it more as the word psyche. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's the root word of psychology, the study of the mind and behavior. So soul is connected with our psyche. The word soul is connected with our mind. So suke is essentially the seat of our mind our emotions, and our will. It's our thinker, it's our feeler, it's our expressor, it shapes our personality. 
So when we talk about maturing in our mind, what we're really talking about is the realm of the soul, not the spirit. It's not the spirit that needs to be renewed because our spirit is all, it has already been renewed. Our spirit is born again. Our spirit is alive unto God. Our spirit is one with the Lord. Our spirit is one with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not really our, our spirit that needs to be renewed, but it's the soulish part of us. It's our minds that need to be renewed because the renewing of the mind is the key to transformation. The renewing of our mind is the key to transformation. And that's the part we need to mature in. I want you to notice what Romans chapter 12, verse number 2 says. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice that phrase. Be transformed. Be totally changed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when we talk about spiritual growth, spiritual growth is really soul growth. I like to say it's getting on the soul train. It's it's training our soul, it's training our mind, getting our mind, will, and emotion to come in line with what has already happened to us in our spirit. You see, uh, you see, our spirit, we've been raised with Christ. We've been made spiritually alive, and our spirit has been perfected in Christ. Our spirit is as righteous as it will ever be, and our spirit is in eternal union with Christ. So there's no improvements that need to be made at the spiritual level. We're perfect, whole, complete as spiritual beings in Christ. But if that's true, why do we see immaturity in the lives of Christians? Why did we all experience immaturity? Because immaturity is not a matter of spirit. Immaturity is a matter of soul. Immaturity is a matter of our minds. So when you see immaturity in your life as a Christian... When, you know, when, 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 your, when your thought life is taking your life in a direction contrary to where the Holy Spirit wants to take your life, and you begin to see immaturity in your life, listen, you don't have to go and get saved again. You don't have to come to the altar every week and get saved again because it's your spirit that's already saved. Your problem's not with your spirit. It's not about coming up and rededicating your life over and over and over and over again. It's not about making a fresh commitment Because your spirit is already saved, it's already born again. Your problem is not in the area of the spirit where you need to have another spiritual rededication or a spiritual commitment or or to get saved again. No, it's not a spirit issue. It is a soul issue. It is a mind issue. It's an issue of maturing in our faith, growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and maturing in our mind. For I want you to understand this. It's that you are justified by faith and faith alone. You are justified by faith. You are saved by grace through faith. That, 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 that's what gets you born again and saved. Justified by faith, but you're transformed when you renew your mind. You're transformed when you renew your mind. So often as a pastor, For many years, I struggled. Why are people that claim to be Christians and sitting in church year after year after year after year, why why do they still live contrary to how the Spirit would have them to live? Why do they still have the same habits and the same struggles and the same attitude and the same meanness and the same critical spirits and the same judgmental spirits and the same hatefulness, even the same prejudices? How can we call ourselves a a Christian and still stay in the same patterns? And I came to two options. Number one, either that person really wasn't saved at all, or maybe they were immature believers in Christ who had yet to experience a renewal of their mind that brought about transformation in their life. 
We're justified on the basis of our simple faith in Jesus. But if we want to see change and transformation, that happens in the realm of our soul. It happens in the realm of our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior, because we're in a process of continual maturity and continue renewing our mind. Because everything in this growth process is rooted in the battleground of our mind. So that's why the morning after you receive Christ Jesus, you woke up with a brand new spirit. You woke up with a brand new heart. But you didn't wake up with a brand new, renewed mind. That's what Paul means when he says to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The word transform here is the idea in the word for metamorphosis. To change from one form to the other. And we're familiar with that a picture be by the picture of a caterpillar and a butterfly. Of course, a caterpillar you know, goes through a process of cocooning and it comes out a butterfly. But something happens. If you were to, if you were to take a scientist and, and examine a, a DNA sample of a caterpillar and a DNA sample of, of a butterfly, or after it becomes a butterfly, the DNA would be absolutely identical between when it was a caterpillar and when it was a butterfly. The difference is it went through a process. The caterpillar is equipped from birth with all the qualities and all the tools necessary to become and transform into a butterfly. But it has to go through the process. Just in the same way, when we are, are born again, we have everything we need for life and godliness. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessing. Christ put his spirit on the inside of you. You lack nothing in Christ. But to make that transformation, the cocoon is the transforming of our lives through the renewing of our minds. We must go through this process that, as we talked about last week, we're becoming who we already are. That's the true process, if you will, of discipleship. A process of becoming. Becoming in practice who Christ has already made us to be. Not through a law-based system of maturity where it's about doing more and trying harder and praying better and following more rules, but a spirit-based transformation that flows out of relationship, that brings everything that Christ has put on the inside of you out as you abide in Christ and walk in the Spirit. So today I want to give us three things very quickly of how we can renew our minds and some, some emphasis on some areas that will help us in this maturing process. So in the process of maturing in our minds, the first thing I want you to see is that we must condition our minds to believe that we are who God says we are. You must condition your mind to believe that you are who God says you are. You have to condition your mind to believe the truths of the gospel instead of the lies of the enemy. Because listen, from the time you are born, everybody is telling you who you are. Everybody is putting their approval or, or disapproval on you. People are defining your life. They're telling you how much you're worth. They're telling you if you're good enough or if you're not good enough. Sometimes people will call us failures. Sometimes people will say that we are no good. Sometimes people will call us mistakes. Sometimes people will tell us that we're not worth their time. And if we're not careful, we will listen to other people and let them define our lives. Or we'll listen to our feelings and let our feelings define our lives. We'll listen to the enemy when he gets into our ears and let the enemy define our lives. But there's one person as a child of God who you should listen to that defines your life. And that is to believe that you are who God says that you are. That way when these thoughts come in our lives to try to move us away on who we are in Christ, we can reject those lies. And that we can continue to live 
and we can continue to believe the truth of the gospel, who God says that we are. Our worth, our identity is not based in our feelings. Our worth, our identity is not based in other people's opinions. Our worth, our identity is based upon Jesus who loved us so much and God who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that he considered us worthy enough to die for us so that we can always be good enough for him. So God says that we're righteous. God says that you're a saint. God says that you are his child. God says that you are complete in him. God says that you are a new creation. God says that you are loved. So therefore, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter the opinions. It doesn't even matter how we feel. So maturing in our minds means we are not moved away from the truth of our identity because of the lies that we are told. Because as we're maturing, we're conditioning our minds to believe about us what God says about us. But the question is, when these lies come, how can we condition our mind? How can we battle against these thoughts? Well, that leads us to point number two. Point number two is that we are to learn how to take our thoughts captive. We are to learn how to take thoughts captive, to take thoughts. Because thoughts are going to come in your life. You will hear opinions. You will talk to yourself. You will hear lies. So they will come. But the important thing is that you learn how to take those thoughts when they come and to take them captive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, in this passage, Paul is talking about spiritual warfare. And he's talking about the fact that our weapon as believers are not the same weapons that the world fights with. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds. What are strongholds? Well, he goes on to define what he means here by strongholds. We destroy arguments. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That means these strongholds in our lives will try to come as arguments, lofty opinions that raise against the knowledge of God. And they come into our lives and we are to, to wage war against those strongholds by taking them captive and bringing them back under the obedience of Christ or what Christ says about them and the thoughts of Christ. So it's learning to take thoughts captive. So that simply means taking control over our thought life, over the things we orient our thoughts to or upon or around, the things that we dwell on in our lives, the strongholds that we let into our minds. Because listen, what we put in our minds has a great effect on how we think. So the truth is we need to take responsibility for our thought life. We need to watch what comes in. And not only do we need to watch what comes in, we need to watch what stay, what we let stay in there. Because we can let those thoughts and those strongholds come in and let them stay in there and it will affect our lives. So Philippians tells us that we are to think on certain things. The things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Things that are excellent or praiseworthy to think on these things. So whenever we're feeling thoughts of, of anxiety or depression or temptation to gravitate towards sin, we need to take those thoughts captive. We need to say, that is not a God thought. I have the mind of Christ, and that is not a Christ thought. That is not a thought that is going to lead me to life. That is not a thought that leads me in righteousness. That's a thought that tries to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm not going to believe that lie. I'm not going to receive that thought. I'm going to take that captive, and I'm going to bring it under the obedience of Christ, and I'm going to think on godly things. So whenever we're feeling that those, those thoughts come in, we take those thoughts captive by identifying the lie that is coming into us at the moment by calling it out for what it is, and returning our minds to a place of peace 
when it's set on Christ. You know, the scripture says that he will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him. So we need to condition our mind to believe what Christ says about us. We do that by when thoughts come in, we take them captive and refuse to dwell on them and refuse to believe them and, and cast them down. But then we need to replace those old thoughts. So we can replace those old thoughts when we fix our mind on heavenly things. You see, you can't keep your mind on the things of the earth and expect to live in the abundance of the life of heaven that you have on the inside of you. So we must fix our minds on heavenly things. So Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says this. Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, which we have, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Don't waste your time on the things of the earth. Set your minds, verse 2 says, set your mind on things above. Let me read it again. Set your minds on things above. Let me read it again. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So many times we are so preoccupied with the things of this world that we fail to set, or we keep our minds on the things of this world and fail to set our minds on heavenly things. But see, our position in Christ is a heavenly position. We are seated with him in heavenly places. So it's, you can't walk in the fullness of Christ if you're seated in heavenly places, but your mind is on earthly things. It's not that we need to go back and take our position back again because we haven't fallen from that position. We just need to move our minds from earth up into heaven. We need to let our thinking match our position. For people that are, are natural thinking people and earthly thinking people and move with everything in this world, it's because they have natural fleshly and earthly thoughts. What we should do is elevate our thought life to our position in Christ. Move from earth to heaven, from natural to spiritual. So the key is to set your mind on the right things. To put in your mind the right things. To, to take out of your mind, to take captive those things from your mind that are the wrong things. Because ultimately, again, maturity is about responsibility. And we must be intentional about our thought life. You choose. I choose what I dwell on every day. Sometimes I can't help the thoughts that come in my mind. But I can help what I do with those thoughts when they come in to my mind. Dallas Willard says this. He said, of all the things we do, we have more freedom with respect to what we will think of where we will place our minds than anything else. And the freedom of thinking is a direct order to exercise it. We simply turn our mind to whatever it is we choose to think of. So you can choose to set your mind on the lies and believe the lies. You can choose to set your mind on how bad everything is or how bad you perceive everything to be. You can choose to set your mind on your faults. You can choose to set your mind on worry or fear. You can choose to set your mind on your natural desires. Or you can intentionally choose to set your mind on things above. To set your mind on faith instead of worry. To set your mind on worship to set your mind on who you are in Christ and tell yourself that over and over again, to set your mind on the blessings that you have in Jesus. Maturity, part of maturity and growing up, part of growing up in, our, in, in the natural world is that as you grow, there's more responsibility that you have. So we have a responsibility if we want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of, our Lord, knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to take into account the renewing of our mind and to set our mind on things above. So three things that we need to do 
as far as this process of renewing our minds. Number one, review. Review. Review the things that we let in our mind. If you're feeding your mind the wrong stuff, your life is going to produce the wrong results. So review what you put in your mind. Number two, recognize. Recognize when negative thoughts come and take them captive. Don't believe the lies. So we review, we recognize, and the third thing is that we replace. We replace. We replace those old thoughts with new thoughts. We replace the lies with the truth. We replace the the badness with the goodness. We think on the things we're supposed to think about. So this week, let's think about what we think about. Let's mature in our minds. Let's review what we put in our minds. Let's recognize when negative thoughts come and take them captive. And let's replace with thoughts of truth and thoughts of goodness, thoughts that line up with the gospel. Well, again, thank you for joining us online. Uh, We look forward to being back together, worshiping in the worship center here at Connect Church next Sunday. But we pray that you have a wonderful week. Let's go out and let's mature this week in our minds and walk in the fullness of all that Jesus has for us. God bless you.